what recent advancements in cardiac medicine are you adapting in your treatment of patients? Okay, well, let, let me uh, paraphrase it to say what we're trying to do is to try to bring the reach of science to the people, you know, to make sure that advances that have been recognized elsewhere have been validated are readily available and accessible. So let's begin with the way we're using technology, you know, to make this thing happen. Uh, one of the challenges you face in uh, low resource economies is to get the right set of expertise into the community. Because the cost of getting that expertise into the community is very high, and you're competing for those experts with more established societies where you cannot afford to pay them what those other people will pay them. And you cannot afford to create the infrastructure in the national society that they're used to elsewhere. They're not likely going to pack up and move to Jamaica. They're not likely going to pack up and move to Nigeria. They're not going to pack up and move to Ghana. So what do we do? We use technology to break that, that barrier and make it easier for them to stay where they are and provide services in Jamaica or Nigeria or Ghana. How we do that is by looking at what the skill sets are. The, what we do in cardiology requires a lot of diagnostics. It is easy for me to take young college graduates and bring them into my lab in Jamaica and then give them one year of solid training in diagnostic imaging. I teach them how to do echocardiography, which is ultrasound exam of the heart. I teach them how to do stress testing. I teach them how to do whole time monitoring. Now, the next thing I do is I build a strong technology platform with a lot of smart people that know how to manage technology. And then we use these individuals that we have trained to do the diagnostic studies and then we collect the information, we dump it on our server, and then send it to a cloud server, and then the guy in the United States or Germany or Britain or Canada can sit in the comfort of his uh, uh, you know, location at Mayo Clinic or Vanderbilt University or wherever, and log into the system, review this diagnostic data, and provide expert opinion. This is the way medicine is practiced. So when we do that, we're taking advantage of the intellectual capital that we cannot locate in Jamaica to provide services to patients in Jamaica or Nigeria or elsewhere. Once these are also individuals who are very much in tune with the latest advances in cardiovascular medicine. Mm -hmm. And because they are in tune with the latest advances in cardiovascular medicine, they can translate the same to the patients we take care of. Once we know that that can be done, it encourages us to acquire technologies that embrace these latest advances in technology. A case in point is that we have a freestanding cath lab, for example, where we can do primary intervention for patients having heart attack. We are launching our mobile heart service, emergency ambulance service that dedicated to heart care only. We're doing a 24 hour service to allow patients to come in and get care. Guess what? When the patients come into the lab and they do the angiograph, then I have the advantage of having experts from all over the world that can log into the system and look at that image and advise the interventional cardiologists on the ground that this is the best approach. Maybe this is one that will require intervention with placement of a stent, or maybe this is the one that we will need to get our friendly surgeon at the cardiac surgery program to come and take a look and take the patient to surgery. But it's about collaboration, taking advantage of the expertise that we can amass from all over the world using advances in technology. For, for, for some doctors who might be looking at this program tonight, listening to you, who are thinking about participating? How how do they go about being part of this um, of this program? Easy. Send me an email. Email at caribbeanheart.com. We are very eager to collaborate with anyone who share the same passion and the same commitment and is going to be loyal to the program. That is the number one requirement. That's the only requirement. 
you know, if you have something to contribute and you want to join us, just shoot me an email. We're constantly looking for training opportunities for our staff. We're partnering with St. Jude Medical in the United States now. We're going to be sending two young people to the United States for training as pacemaker technologists. That has never happened in the Caribbean. So these individuals will now come home and support pacemaker implantation technology in the region. That is one of the things we try to do well by building people. The way we build people is to give them skill sets that will serve the community. And that way we build internal capacity and we keep this program going. I want this thing to keep on going years after I'm gone. Dr. Madhu, with, with, with all your experiences, all your lectures, and all your, your, your journals that, 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 that you've written, what still surprises you in, in the field of cardiology? And also, what still surprises you about yourself in, in, in cardiology? Um, well, the surprise in cardiology is that, you know, the, the discoveries never seem to stop. You know, it's, it, you always, there is always something new coming down the pike. There is always an improvement in the way we do things. You know, so in, in a way, you think we've reached a limit. There are hundreds of cardiology journals researchers are publishing things but almost on a daily basis we are finding new discoveries that improve the way we do things now about myself i i'm not sure that um i, I know exactly what surprises me except that you know some people think i should be tired already but i think i'm just warming up i like that i really do like that we we need we need lights like you in the Caribbean and Africa. So so please don't get tired. Do, do, do you have do you have any regrets or unfulfilled dreams now? No 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 not at all. I I just uh, you know I, the well, only regret I have is not a personal regret. The regret I have is that I was hoping that by now the mental colonization of my people would have receded it hasn't We're can still you still mentally enslaved that is my only regret ah. wow that's powerful what is one thing about you most people do not know that would surprise them um you know i think <laughs> 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 what will surprise them is, you know, actually, I do sleep. <laughs> one, of, one of my colleagues uh, is of telling people that I never sleep. That's, that's not true. I actually do sleep. <laughs> but, sorry, sorry. You know, just... but I, think, I think many people will be, you know, surprised that I do enjoy a quiet time with my son. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to sometimes just, uh, you know, play around with him. Yeah. And not, you know, I be, you know, some pe people who think they know me uh, think that my time, all my time is uh, consumed with serious matters. But I like some um, levity, as we say in Jamaica. <laughs> Looking back, what, what would you change, if anything, about your education, way of doing business? Would you change anything? Um, you know, yes. What, what I'll change is I wish that, you know, I'm very grateful for coming to the United States of America. I wish I had the, I wish my eyes opened to what was possible to the extent. I guess when I was younger in Nigeria, I always knew a lot of things were possible. I always knew that we could make a lot of difference. But coming to the United States showed me how and how a society can organize itself in such a way that individuals who may be ordinary people are never afraid of standing up for something mm. and forcing a difference. The, 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 what America taught me is that the, the group think is not 
always the way to go. You can break out of the group and do what people think is impossible, but just believe in yourself and believe that it is possible and you'll get it done. And there are many stories like that all over America. I want to see more stories like that across the Caribbean and Africa. When are you most happy? Uh, say what? When are you most happy? When I'm at home. <laughs> what what is gratifying about being Dr. Ernest Madu? Um, you know, just I I love the fact that I have the determination and the persistence to stay the course in what I believe in. If I believe in something, mm -hmm. I will see it through to the end. You know, so that's what I like about myself. I am not afraid of taking on a challenge because I have the confidence that I will overcome that challenge. And that's what has helped our mission. Because like I said before, there were people who were out to make sure that this heart center business you're talking about don't happen in this place. And those people are still there, you know. But the message that I always send to them is you're messing with the wrong person because we are not going anywhere. We are going to do bigger and better things because that's the right thing to do. As long as I know that what we're doing is making a difference in the lives of people. Yes. You know, as considered as it might sound, I really think that this is a calling from God. I don't have to be a pastor. This is my pastoral mission. And I do not believe that any human being can stop me. Only God can say, don't do this. But now I'm hearing the voice of God saying, be part of solving this problem in Africa and the Caribbean. And I'm listening. And I'm yeah. obedient to that word. And we will keep on going. You know, I'm almost tempted to end the show on that note because it is so powerful and riveting and encouraging. But God is also saying, ask you just a few more questions. So please be a little patient with me. What are you most proud of, Dr. Madhu? You know, interestingly, I'm most proud of my son. Amen. My, my son, you know, again, is somebody who overcame significant challenges in his young life. Mm. And to watch him the way he is now, blossoming and being a very fine young man that is what i'm most proud of oh. well, finish the sentence i look forward to sunday evenings too oh to do father and son things oh <laughs> <laughs> you know let me tell you one of the things you know i am trying to get to brazil with my son oh. to watch the world cup right and with you know, just the whole idea of trying to figure out which game we're going to see, you know, or oh, does he want to go? He doesn't want to go. Oh, he's excited about going. To me, that is the greatest joy ever, you know, to think that I'm going to be able to disappear with him for a few days, just me and him, going to watch oh, soccer. Oh, gosh. That is uh, what I'm looking forward to. This is beautiful. What are you most thankful for? I'm most thankful, you know, for the family, you know, that I was born into, to the family that I have inherited, I've grown into, uh, the support that I've gotten from my family, and, um, you, know, you know, that has been invaluable, you know, so that is uh, the thing I'm most thankful for. And I'm most thankful also for the gift that God has given me, you know, to be able to do things that actually can impact the lives of thousands of people. And to see that what we have done have been recognized by people all over the world and being asked to come to different places in the world, different parts of the world, to help them to do the same thing, to impact yet several other thousands of people. That is something that I'm very grateful for. Raphael said, what is the state of implementation of digital medical records in Jamaica, Nigeria, and Ghana, do you think that this is that this is important to pursue now? Um, electronic medical records. Implementation of digital medical records. Yes. 
So, but absolutely. You know, I, I think that's the way we implemented electronic medical records uh, in Jamaica nearly 10 years ago from the time we started. At the time, it was only about 18% of practices in the United States had digital medical records. Now, what is so important to know is that it saves lives because it minimizes medical errors. When you document, then everyone else who is taking care of a patient has access to what you have documented. It's clear and legible. You know, remember in the days past, one of the things they used to say, doctor's handwriting, you can't read it, as if it's a badge of honor. If you can't read it, then you're prone to errors. Now, with digital medical records, those records are portable. If you're seeing a patient in Ghana, you can look at the medical records from Jamaica by just going online. It's on the cloud. Our facilities in Nigeria have digital medical records. Uh, we have a patient from Nigeria, actually, as I'm speaking to you, who was seen at our facility in Nigeria, had some things done, and was transferred to the Jamaican facility to complete his assessment and treatment. And all those records are online digitally, and they are, they are safe because they are secured by encrypted passwords. Only those who are taking care of the patients have access to these records. And these things also now have inbuilt neural intelligence that when you do certain things, it will prompt you with questions, say, okay, this patient has heart failure. Is he on this medication? Doctors do forget things. When the digital record asks you, as you're documenting your note, why this patient is not on this, it forces you to think about what you're doing. It, I think it's critical. It is timely, it is available, it is possible, it is actually not complicated. That's amazing. That uh, is truly amazing. Come uh, talk to me, I will help them get it done. Doctor, if, if you could go back in time, what would you tell that 16-year-old boy? Stay true to your vision. Do not let anybody tell you that you cannot do it. If you believe, do not let anyone convince you otherwise. Just stay focused, stay passionate, pursue your passion. That is what is going to make you great. And the question I ask every guest, what makes you laugh out loud? <laughs> makes you laugh out loud. <laughs> Come on, you stop me with that one. Um, <laughs> you know what? Let me tell you, uh, satire and makes me laugh out loud. One of my favorite things is the uh, Borowitz Report from New Yorker. Uh, when I when I read that, I find myself laughing out loud. <laughs> Doctor Dr. Madu, I I thank you so much for your time. I thank you for your patience. You, you know, you're such a uh, 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 a man of technology that you understood and, and I appreciate your grace I appreciate your kindness and again this is what we're talking about persistence yes you get it done technology does work you have to believe that it will work you have to stay committed to it ultimately you figure it out it, it is just it's just amazing it's, it's, it's interesting that all the setting up was done and everything was so perfect. And then the creator <laughs> stepped in to show us who is boss. Or oh, so you have set it up. Well, I'm going to demonstrate to you the importance of commitment and persistence and dedication. Exactly. Dr. Madhu, I would love to invite you to come back on again. I think time cheated us, but I believe in faith. I believe in the flow. So I believe everything was perfect. But thank you so much and keep up the good work. I will do whatever I can to encourage others to contact you and to participate in this very innovative initiative that you have started here in the Caribbean and Africa. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.